So let me introduce the speakers from Afghanistan. So we have uh, Ponderoy Manoto, who is the Chief Technical Advisor for ILO on the Road to Jobs Programme. And he's going to be kicking us off with a description of the putting, putting everything in context. And then he'll hand over to his colleagues, uh, Yang Mohammed Dosti, who is a monitoring uh, MRM officer for the Road to Jobs Programme, and uh, Zakia, Zakia Saran, sorry, Samimi, who works on ILO's uh, SIYB programme in Afghanistan, which actually has been running for a long time in Afghanistan. Yeah, that's about it for me. Um, Sondarai, please take us away. Thank you so much. Uh, hello to uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Tonderai. Uh, as, as, as already introduced, uh, I've been working on this project for the past five years now. And the, this, this project is not about building roads. Uh, it's, it's called the road to jobs, uh, which, which simply sought to leverage the road infrastructure that uh, Swedish CEDA had invested in in the north of Afghanistan uh, to try and open up the hard to reach areas to uh, urban, urban markets. So we then followed this up with the market systems development project which um, mainly focused on uh, creating decent jobs, uh, increasing incomes uh, for uh, the poor in general and specific migrant uh, workers uh, and, and micro, small to medium enterprises. But when, when you hear about Afghanistan, uh, I, I think everybody is just thinking, okay, so how, how, how did you guys survive this? Uh, today, we, we're not talking about how we survived this, but we're talking about how we navigated our way around the, the kind of challenges that this environment presents. One, fragility, two, a protracted kind of conflict, and, and then in between punctuated by droughts. So the major kind of contextual issues here, when I talk of conflict, you're looking at security and the challenges that it poses towards implementation, then, then you, the biggest casualty in a protracted conflict is the markets and uh, you, you end up with thin markets and having to then try and implement a market systems development program, which is characterized or, or in an environment characterized by very thin markets. And then of course, a lot of aid intensity, which also has major implications on uh, who buys into what you are trying to do because there's so much money lying around and it's for free and uh, uh, it's for everything. Uh, so this is the context in which our project actually operated. Um, not insurmountable when, when you stick to MSD principles and you, you, you decide you're going to be adaptive and respond to whatever market signals present themselves as you as you work. So I, I will hand over to Dosti uh, to kick us off and Zakia will come in. We pulled out just two examples of uh, how we navigated our way around these challenges and 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 how we managed to end up with the results that show that it is possible in a difficult environment like this to work 
and achieve systemic change. So over to you, Dost. Uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, colleagues. Uh, my name is John Muhammad Dosti. I am currently working as Monitoring and Results Measurement Officer for Road to Decent Jobs for All Afghans project. Previously, I worked as uh, previously I worked as mon uh, local economic development coordinator for Road to Decent uh, Road to Jobs project. Today, uh, I'm going to talk about women economics empowerment, a case study about uh, developing work, working uh, conditions or decent working conditions for the women in corporate uh, subsector. So basically, uh, the project selected corporate sector because it had a cotton component. And the project was targeting uh, cotton uh, value chain, so working in cotton value chain. The project aimed to improve working conditions, uh, improve incomes, increase incomes, market opportunities, and skills for the uh, corporate subsector. Also, the corporate sub uh, subsector provided uh, a very good opportunity for job creation and employment for women, especially uh, those who are uh, returnees, migrants, uh, internally displaced uh, persons. The project found out that the main co the constraint for uh, women not being able to earn enough uh, in corporate subsector or uh, their lack of skill and also the root cause obviously was the uh, lack of opportunity for these semi-skilled uh, uh, women including migrants, returnees uh, and internally displaced persons. Uh, they were not able to meet the demand that, uh, that was existing. So they, they only need traditional carpet waving skills. They only had traditional carpet waving skills. Therefore, the project designed uh, an intervention initially in 2018 with Afghan Bazaar Carpet Company, which is a carpet exporting company. Uh, they had very good knowledge of the, what the international market, what the customers wanted. Uh, they, they were exporting carpets. But on the other hand, also, uh, they their demands were more, they were not able to produce enough because uh, the women, the corporate waivers lacked skill. Therefore, project designed an intervention with them aiming to upskill these uh, refugees, returnees and internally displaced persons so they could, uh, they could participate in the market, they could participate in this uh, subsector. Uh, warm, uh, women who are waving carpets, they, uh, they actually know carpet waving traditionally, or they knew waving carpets traditionally, but they lacked uh, basic functional literacy, which is required for these modern designs, for these new designs, which are also called digital designs. Uh, therefore, the, uh, the project designed and implement, uh, an intervention with this uh, company and implemented with this company in 2018, uh, through which then this company trained these women on modern designs, which are called also uh, digital designs, women learned uh, this functional literacy, which are numbers, color combinations, how to do that color combinations and stuff like that. Uh, the company trained them and uh, they were so successful that uh, another company emerged from Afghan Bazaar company in uh, early 2019 or late 2019, uh, uh, a woman Afghan Bazaar company came out and uh, uh, registered her own uh, business, carpet waving business, which then she also worked with the project she approached the project and the second intervention was designed with this company. So uh, they, they both these companies, they together trained actually uh, these two interventions, uh, trained like 400 women in carpet weaving, digital design, modern designs, around 14 jobs were created. And then because of the Marhabosarin Handicraft Company, which was the second company, uh, they adopted and adapted the business model they actually offered women uh, to open bank account for them. Uh, they also offered women to sell looms so women can own looms, go to their houses or their own homes, and then even employ more people. Uh, among those people, uh, 50 women opted to open bank account, uh, 50 women paired in groups, and they jointly purchased some 25 looms, which they installed and then employed more people to work with them. And those numbers that I just mentioned that not included extra numbers, 
So Marha Bozarin and the craft company and Afghan Bazaar uh, company, they, they were so good in the market that even more uh, uh, companies and more businesses started uh, replicating the model. Uh, around uh, only these two company uh, established eight more uh, carpet weaving centers and also uh, more four more businesses uh, emerged later on from these uh, in the subsector of carpet carpet weaving and uh, two of these companies are actually emerged from Afghan Bazaar itself. They are women owned companies. Now they weave carpets and they sell in international markets. Uh, uh, on, uh, on addition to that, what, what happened with these two uh, businesses, the other companies also uh, understood the value of having carpet centers. So more carpet centers have been actually established. And uh, Afghan Bazaar established a child care, which is, they call it kindergarten, and some people call it nurseries. They, uh, they established nurseries within their centers. So women could actually uh, bring their two, three years old kids with them the kids could play and learn while the mothers could continue to work. Uh, it was identified by the companies. One of the constraints or, or perhaps one of the reasons some of the women were not able to come and work for in corporate uh, centers was because they had a kid at home and they could not bring the kid or they could not leave the kid at home alone. So uh, the companies now, almost every carpet weaving center has a, a kindergarten, a nursery where uh, children can play and learn, their mothers can work. And during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, what happened later with these companies, they approached certified business uh, coaches, uh, which uh, they together decided to change the working modality. And uh, a lot of uh, women now owns the looms or the companies provide them loom and raw material. Loom is the machine which they use to wave carpets on. And then the companies provide them with loom and raw material at their houses and women continue to work from their homes. And uh, th this has actually uh, improved uh, the working condition for a lot of women and the income because of productivity increases. And uh, even for the businesses, because the quality improved, the productivity increased <clears throat> and the companies now can, uh, like a lot of people outside, they have learned to wave this digital designs and they are starting to train other people in the communities which resulted in a lot of jobs and uh, incomes for the people. Uh, Marha Bozarin, I, uh, I mentioned earlier, was one of the companies which then inter was interviewed uh, during our final independent evaluation. I will finish my presentation here with the, this quote from our uh, final independent evaluation. Uh, she stated that previously women were exhausted. They were tired. They were working long hours, up to 16 hours. and uh, after establishing the centers, after having regular eight hours day working uh, days, they even have two hours of break during that eight hours. The women work together, they learn from each other, they play music, and their kids continue to uh, uh, stay in nurseries and kindergarten and learn. And that has been changed in the carpet sector. Uh, now my case study is over. I will hand over to uh, Zakia to present her case study. Thank you, Dushti, uh, and hello everyone uh, who are joining from any place in the world. So uh, this is Zakia Sammi, I'm the Communication and Job Placement Manager from SIYB, Start and Improve Your Business uh, Company in Afghanistan. Um, today, I'd like to talk about I'd like to talk about SIYB Afghanistan Company, which is an achievement of the Root to Job ILO project in Afghanistan. So first of all, we need to know what is SIYB. It is stands for Start and Improve Your Business. And it is a training program which is organized uh, in Sweden and has been developed by international labor organization. And this uh, training package uh, is for small and medium scale enterprises, which is used in more than 19 countries all over the world. The objective uh, of this training module is the development objective is to contribute to private sector development, economic growth and employment creation. And also the immediate objective is to strengthen the capacity of local businesses and to help them survive longer in the market 
And also in the process, it helps people to create job and employment for others. Now, coming to Isaiwa Gia France and Company, the name is taken from that training. It is a business consulting company which was found in 2017 uh, with the support and partnership of UN, uh, United Nations International Labour Organization and a United States Agency for International Development or USID. So uh, this company, why we have established this company and what was the challenge in the market? Statistically, there was 80% of new established companies and businesses in Afghanistan um, failed and they could, not, they could not survive more than three years. And also, the, the problem was they did not have a concrete business idea and also they, didn't, uh, they couldn't develop a standard business plan. And there was no entity providing a standard business startup training uh, to them as well. So, to overcome these challenges, we set up SIYB Afghanistan Company in 2017 to support businesses generate can create business ideas and also to support them develop a standard business plans and to help them survive um, in the, and survive and live longer in the market. So how we set up uh, this organization, um, the SIYB and Gata Hate trainers who have been trained by UNILO in 2016 have come up together to make a platform, a unity, and to market these two training packages in Afghanistan, which were new and people were not acquainted with that. And then they started conducting training of entrepreneurs and sharing the results in the market and to the people. Right now, these are the services we are providing for, uh, for our clients and beneficiaries. And most of them are the packages which has been brought by UNILO in Afghanistan and are accredited and licensed. This is a balance of the activities we have done so far. Uh, the main, uh, uh, our main clients are the um, national and international um, entities, staff, and also beneficiaries, IDPs, and returnees who are uh, who want to start a business. Uh, so about the team we are working, um, the SIYB Afghanistan company has been established by four people. And now we have six full-time and four part-time employees and more than 19 members all over Afghanistan, which this number is expanding rapidly. What we have done so far, what are the results? Um, so we, uh, right now we have nine master trainers in Afghanistan, which uh, seven of them are certified and two of them are um, self potential. We have 19 trainers. And we have trained more than 5,000 entrepreneurs, which luckily 68% of, of them are women. And from these 5,000 entrepreneurs, 50% of them have started their business and improved. And uh, we also have created 4,066 um, jobs to people to uh, have the result of these business startups. And as you see in the figures, these are the, uh, the results we have from uh, conducting SIYB trainings. And this is from the Gata Hate training, which is Gender Entrepreneurship Together, a package uh, which is especially for women, illiterate women who want to start a business. And this is a balance of the businesses uh, that have been started after um, taking the SIYB and Get Ahead trainings. We have a lot of examples like starting, opening a restaurant, um, honey and jam production, the designing centers, carpet weaving, and uh, many more. So our coverage area, we started from, from uh, Balfe province in the north of Afghanistan, but right now we are in uh, all four regions, north, east, west, and central region. As you see in the map, the blue provinces are uh, provinces which SIYB is currently active in, 
Uh, the orange provinces are the provinces which SI will be introduced at and soon it will be active. And the rest of the provinces, we are trying to cover them as well. And we have office in um, North region and Central region, which are Balfe and Kabul provinces. The greatest achievements we had so far is the strategic and sustainable partnership we have with various governmental, national and international counterparts. As you see the logos here, we have trained the, the staffs of these organizations to become SIYB trainers and also their beneficiaries, which are mostly IDPs and returnees. IDPs, inter, uh, internally displaced people. Talking about the progress and market share and challenges of um, the SIYB in Afghanistan. So it is not only SIYB Afghanistan which is providing the service to people, but also Aris and NFA are two other organizations. We have started, um, the program has launched in Afghanistan in 2016 and then it followed the establishment of SIYB Afghanistan company and it has been recognized as the first uh, training service provider or TSP in Afghanistan by SIYB Global based in Geneva. And after that, to better, um, uh, to provide better service uh, for um, SIYB trainers, the SIYB Afghanistan company took the initiative and devised uh, and modified SIYB books or manuals in two local languages, which are Dari and Pashto. And uh, they have been given the copyrights of SIYB books in Afghanistan by UNI Law Headquarter in Geneva. And so far, we are providing these manuals to all TSPs in Afghanistan. Uh, and also, we are responsible to collect the data of all trainings which are being conducted in, in Afghanistan and report them annually to uh, SIYB Global in Geneva. And subsequently, SIYB program grew very rapidly in Afghanistan. And today, there are more than three TSPs who are providing this service. The reason behind our success is that SIYB Afghanistan functions as a unified entity among all SIYB trainers across the country, and also it ensures quality service delivery. Uh, the second uh, is introduction of the program to wider spectrum to donors, and uh, donors who are working in Afghanistan, as you saw in the previous slides. We also act as a unified umbrella for 75% of TSPs uh, who are providing the SIYB uh, services in Afghanistan. And also, we are the single supplier of modified SIYB learning materials in Afghanistan, which assures high quality in learning materials for the program. And the last uh, slide, which is about the challenges we are facing right now, um, with the rapid growth of SIYB program, the, comp uh, the competition accelerated with, between uh, TSPs or training service providers. And unfortunately, there are some unfair competition in the market with the donor funds. Uh, some of the organizations which uh, are, have donor funds, they are competing with us and they are uh, conducting uh, training of trainers with donor money. Um, and also they are violating the copyright and law and responsibly trying to print out the SIYB materials, which have been revised and modified by SIYB Afghanistan. And also, they are preferring uh, quantity over quality, which is uh, violating the SIYB global standards. Even though, uh, um, through uh, these challenges, even by using these challenges, we have had a remarkable success so far. But if the uh, do no harm principle are not followed by the TSPs, um, the future of SIYB program and sustainability will be in due parity. So thank you. If you have any question, I'm here to answer. Thank you, Zia. Uh, I, I, I will quickly uh, uh, put all this together. You, you, you have had the opportunity to to listen to Dosti um, and and the case study uh, on, on carpets and and Zakia Zakia is an entrepreneur 
So SIYB Afghanistan is not a road to jobs project. It's a company, it's a private company that emerged as a result of the investment in skills that the project did. We saw that there were business development services available in the market, but they were not uh, suited or congruent to the needs of micro and small and small businesses. Most of the businesses we have worked with in the past five years are actually micro. And uh, what, what we set out to do in, in, in an environment like this, because the issue is the environment. How do you make things happen? How do you find your way? Uh, ILO has a tripartite working mechanism which, which pitches government, employers' organizations, and workers' organizations together. And, and we leveraged on that tripartite mechanism to then bring stakeholders together to go through the issues, beginning with rapid market appraisals in the region, and we involved all these stakeholders. And we defined, we found things out together. We came back, we looked at this, we prioritized. We selected the sectors of value chains together, uh, you know, and, and then we, we, we set out to work that allowed private sector actors to also in the process begin to identify where they thought they could come in or they could have advantages, they could see opportunities and so forth and so on. One thing we, we learned was instead of focusing on, on, on a selected sector, we realized if we were going to help the target group, we needed to actually focus on opportunities rather than specific sectors. So we ended up with six value chains, two main ones and four others where we could simply go in and get what we felt were supposed to be quick wins. What that did was to spread the risk. You focus on a value chain and then things don't work. That's already three years gone. And then you haven't even helped anybody. That's why we sort of widened that um, in order to see what could, uh, what benefits could come. With that platform for collaboration, this is where we then began to see the emergence of champions coming in. But uh, one uh, point I want to underline here is we, our, our strategy was the skills part, because we have heard what has already been indicated. And then the, the markets themselves, that, that gap between them is what we worked to try and close by, in most cases, pushing skills uh, to people who could least afford them and then pulling in the markets to begin to develop more confidence to want to work with these groups of, uh, uh, of people. And, and these two uh, examples are trying to show uh, what happens when the private sector agrees to take the risk. It's not easy in an environment like this, but if you stick to what you do best over time, this begins to happen because you want to build trust. It takes time. I, I remember for a time we were well known as those guys who hold meetings 
who hold workshops. That's what we were well known for. But five years down the line, uh, with a $9 million budget, we have more close to 6,000 new jobs created, close to 50,000 jobs that have been improved. And then as ILO being driven by the need for decent work, international labor standards, and, and then the obvious choice of women economic empowerment, and then carpets. Carpets is well known for child labor. Carpets is well known for backbreaking work. And then it's women. And, and women don't get that many opportunities. Now they get an opportunity, it's backbreaking. Then they have their reproductive roles they still have to play. And, and so we, we played on the incentives of our business partners to say, are they willing to go in with us? And, and that's the part we chose to invest in. They want skilled uh, kind of supply chain actors. Then we said, cool, we will jump into that. But can you assure us that there is enough demand on the international market to keep driving these processes? And then it helped to begin to clean up child labor to open up, you know, women friendly kind of work spaces um, to begin to bring down the working hours, working smarter and increasing on productivity, occupational safety and health in the workplace. All those, it's, it's incremental in nature, but the first thing you want to do is to create the job first and then you can begin to build and to improve because you have your partners and they are seeing the benefit. They see where you are going or you, what you are getting at. So they, they trust in the process and they begin to also invest more and more and they become more responsive as you have had the kind of market system change that's begun to happen without the project really getting in there. And, but this is uh, what I would want to say and stop here so that we can discuss this more together. Thank you very much, uh, Tom DeRoy. And thank you, thank you for stopping there because we have, um, we promised them we would stop after half an hour and we have, and you have, which is great. And there's time therefore for us to, to get into the questions. Really interesting presentation, fascinating seeing you know, the, the, the realities on the ground, uh, Dosti and Sakia of, of people's lives and how, and how your programs respectively have really made a difference to people. Um, so let me start by actually throwing a question to you, Dosti. So I'm gonna merge two questions in a way. There was a question we had beforehand, essentially about from um, Hasebullah Salimi about how, to how do you ensure sustainability of the, of the results of the work you're doing? And I want just to sort of put that alongside the question that Hassan Walida also asked, which is about improving the demand for employment in a labor market like Afghanistan that is so affected by, by a protracted crisis. So how do you create sustained demand for employment in a labor market like Afghanistan? Uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you for asking the question, uh, Asibullah Salimi. Uh, well, for market system uh, development, when we work with our private sector partners, it's not the project who creates the employment and job. So if you're asking about the sustainability, it's the businesses. If the market system works, if we are successful to work with a partner, giving the example of uh, carpet again, if Afghan Bazaar is able to sell carpets abroad, Afghan Bazaar is a local, a local business here. They can work in any condition. I, I can now refer this to another question uh, Kevin has previously that said, uh, how do you see or forecast when the troops pull out or the military pull out from Afghanistan? Now these local businesses of Afghanistan, uh, they work continuously. If they have market abroad, if there is market for Afghan made carpets in Europe, Afghan Bazaar will continue to export carpets. For local businesses, uh, the situation is not that much important. I cannot say it's not important. The situation is not that much important 
uh, as it is for a project or for a donor uh, organization here. But uh, these businesses, they will continue to work and that ensures the sustainability. Okay, thank you. And uh, just quick question from Vici, just to clarify. Did ILO provide financial support to these companies to, in the, to share the risks of these innovations? Yes, we did actually. Yes, when we started uh, building the capacity of this woman, we shared those uh, uh, costs with the private sector because we helped them build capacity of these returnees, refugees. They were not able to pay for their skills development themselves. They were, the companies would not have that much trust on building capacity of local women or returnee women, refugees. So project partnered with the company for that specific intervention, but they continue to work there and they continue to expand and grow. When they see the value of training refugee workers and improving their productivity, increasing their productivity and improving their quality, they will continue to do that for themselves. And that ensures sustainability. And, and okay. quickly, quickly, Mike, just, just, just a quick add on. Um, yes, uh, our, our focus was less on hardware. We, 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 we confined our work to the soft kind of bits, number one. Number two, we made sure we did not invest in the core functions of the businesses themselves. So we, we, we negotiated with them so that they could take considerable risk, but at the same time, we sought to de-risk part of that process by making sure the other side was more suited to the deal. I see. Yeah, so it's quite a subtle, a subtle process of deciding how you provide support. Zaki, Zaki, I'm just thinking there's a question here from Babak, who said, um, as a training program, do you also, do you just provide training or do you go, does the, does the program provide any further support to the beneficiaries, to the trainees, in terms of helping them to set up their businesses? Mm -hmm. so, okay. What, what, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Bobak, for the question. Um, actually, when we are the support we are providing for beneficiaries is only the training, um, how they are um, running their business or how this training helped them to run their business is first of all we help them to kind of create a business idea, and it is a three days program. They select a business idea which is based on the demand of the market, and then they develop a business plan to see whether um, um, starting that business is um, profitable for them or not. They will develop the standard business plan with the support of the trainers, and then they will go to the market to start their business, and we follow them up. Um, um, gradually to see in what stage they are and we provide them with the business coaching trainings as well. So uh, um, whatever we are doing is only the service and not financial support. Although we had some uh, some of the donors who um, who had financial support or they, um, they have provided their beneficiaries with the startup capital, but it is only uh, the minimum number of those 5,000 beneficiaries that we have trained. So yeah. Uh, simply, it is only training and uh, not financial support. And the reason behind our success is the follow-up and also the standard and material-based uh, training we are providing for them. Uh, great. Uh, just quickly as well on 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 Zakia's case, um, they. There, there are a number of certified business coaches as well on, on, on their team who are able to work with, with businesses through their kind of day-to-day -day challenges and, and helping to weather the storm as it were. And, and this was a very good uh, case during the, the first wave of COVID-19, where we ended up with, we had 33 private sector partners and not even a single one closed down because they, they we assigned business coaches to work through things with them, even including scaling down 
even including looking for alternative sources of raw materials and so forth and so on. So uh, this, this is what I wanted to quickly uh, also point out. And then we, we also collaborated with humanitarian organizations who usually have money and they, they want to give to people to start livelihood projects. We, we ended up, for example, with the Norwegian Refugee Council, we ended up with a very smart arrangement where they picked up SIYB graduates and started a business plan competition with the local chamber of commerce and industry. And, 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 they, and they, fund, they financed businesses that came out of that particular process from Zakia's hands into a competition and then they, they ended up uh, uh, financing. That's very interesting. And, it, and it, that chimes with a comment actually from Kevin. It's not, not really a question, but Kevin Billing shared, shared some information about a similar sort of approach with a GTZ um, project. I'm not sure where that was, Kevin, but anyway, um, in, in, if you look at the Q&A box, you'll see his comments. It sounds very interesting. Can we, um, there's an interesting question here, to, uh, which is perhaps related to on the right, from Dase or Dase Mahani. Um, about a pilot project that was tried in with a, a telecom company in Afghanistan to expand digital financial services to, to rural populations. He was curious to know how that pilot worked out and what lessons you may have learned. Do you, do you recall that pilot? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard not to recall because the, it's, it's, it's an interesting case. Um, yes, we did uh, a pilot with the um, Afghan Basim uh, and, and the uh, mobile money services have been provided in Afghanistan for quite a time now, but uh, it hasn't gone, you know, it had to reach areas and, and uh, there is a more than 70% uh, kind of proliferation of cell phones in Afghanistan. And you would naturally expect that mobile money services would, would easily just spread, but it's not the case. So these guys took a big risk. They set up a unit and said they were going to go for the mass market. So we agreed to go in with them, but we said, let's focus on the value chains that we are working in. And, and then we try to introduce mobile money services in there and see how they grow. The success has been, they, they recruited mobile money agents and we have a mobile money agent in Mazarif now, up in the north who has grown beyond what this project tried to do. They, they offer more services. They are even linking clients with banks or they are linking into banking accounts of, um, uh, uh, of clients. And they, 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 they are offering quite a suite of services. And when, when COVID-19 came, the demand for these services actually grew because most of the development institutions, even government was finding it difficult to pay people. And that's how this, this whole service then just went boom. And uh, right now it's, it's beyond what, what this project actually set out to, 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 to do. Amazing, amazing. Um, Okay, I'm, I, this isn't jumping around. I wanted to just go back to a really interesting observation that Zakia made towards the end of her presentation about, if you like, the systemic problems that are beginning to emerge in the training market now that there are a lot of providers and competing and so on. And she, she talked very uh, articulately about the problems that arise when people start undercutting standards and 
and you know not respecting uh, intellectual property and so on. And I'm just wondering whether whether SIYB Afghanistan, Zakir, or, or perhaps ILO have thought about what the kind of responses to be to that pro that set of systemic problems might be, because uh, clearly this is where uh, you know a market systems lens should be offering us some guidance, surely. Mm -hmm. Hi. So um, um, what we are thinking to solve this problem is actually there should be one entity in Afghanistan which should be responsible to uh, to have the uh, responsibility of printing out the materials and to keep the um, training standards um, uh, as the way it is. And it should go after all the organizations and also collect the training data and then report back to the Geneva. So it should be in the hand of only one organization. If not, if there are the only um, uh, resource or the only thing uh, tool that we can uh, keep the standards alive is in, uh, yes, the books or the manuals. Because to that, we can grasp or we can know that who are providing training where. And then we can see whether they are um, two trainers in one room, which is part of the uh, global standards, uh, whether they are, um, so we can oversee those trainings if we know that the training is being conducted. And the only source that we can uh, grasp uh, conducting the training is the manuals, because SIYB cannot be conducted without materials. So if there are two to three entities which are printing the material, so we cannot grasp, we cannot really find who is doing what where. So uh, the only immunity tool is that. And uh, uh, in my point of view, we are also trying to solve this problem out with the uh, SIYB global, uh, Geneva Global. Uh, and also um, we may need the support of you in ILO in this case as well to not authorize any other organization because if uh, we are providing the manuals all over the country with no uh, delay and with the good quality service, so why should we, is there any other one who should do it? Um, so this is uh, what we are thinking and we are also trying to solve this problem out. Um, even if not as any other entity, there should be one only. To, to collect the data, to report back to Geneva, or there should be one entity which is uh, which should be um, printing and distributing the manuals, so that to keep the standards alive and to uh, to not put the sustainability of the pro the program in danger. Uh, just quickly, Mike, uh, this is this is SIYB Afghanistan and their perspective. But yes, uh, the, the emergence now of those who want to compete and the how they want to compete is another issue. But I already talked about an aid intensive environment. It, it does undermine, it does distort the markets themselves. But at the same time, um, you see, we, Afghanistan now has everything in terms of the infrastructure for this particular service. And, and, and our belief is um, the best service provider will remain standing at the end of the day. This is, this is, this is what we believe in. Um, are we do are the market actors able to now sell this service to private, you know, uh, individuals? Because we will get to the stage where there will be no more donor money for doing this. Who will remain there still providing this particular, this kind of service? But at the same time, I think it's something that ILO Global uh, SIYB Global needs to come back to and take a very good look at and say, if they want to use a market approach on this service, then we need market principles to be at play. If a private provider is allowed to develop materials, then that becomes their intellectual property. But the, the, the materials that the ILO has 
are actually in the public domain. So once developed, anyone can still pull that out and do what they have to do. But SIYP Afghanistan is good. It's important now for every actor who is there to now come together and, and, and have some kind of a body that then says this using the same standard. Let's, let's come together in order to compete. That's, that's what we think should then happen for some of these other like undercutting and so forth and so on to then go away. But that will need SIYP to also facilitate the process. Yes, it's interesting. So what I'm trying to do subtly is, is, is expand the conversation from SIYB training and carpets to a sort of bigger, more, more general principles about working in a complex environment. And so the, the point you make about the, the influence of donors is obviously really important because we, this is a classic, I mean, the whole point about fragile and complex effective settings is you have this in, inherently rather distorted set of markets because there's a lot of humanitarian or other kind of donor engagement. And, um, and of course, so the pro systemically, I guess the problem isn't just about the supply side that Zakia was kind of talking about. It's also about the demand side. So what, what, what can you do with donors to get them to understand market development principles so that they don't make unnecessary kind of mistakes? I'm thinking of um, things like the, the MERS standard, the, the, market, the, the minimum economic recovery standards um, that describe, you know, how donors working in this humanitarian market nexus space could possibly um, improve what they do and think think about how they use their money in a in a more in a way that doesn't distort markets or that lends itself to recovery more easily. So that that's kind of interesting. We've only got a couple of minutes left, and I'm going to um, hand back to you, Tondurai, just to wrap everything up. Before I do, so what I'm going to ask you, have a think about that really, about what my final question is, is, is in a way, how, what is different about market systems development as a possible solution in exactly this context we're talking about, where you have this, this humanitarian market kind of mixing and this nexus. I, I'm kind of curious, do, are, you, are we convinced that the market systems development approach has something uh, of more value to offer in these kind of fragile and complex settings. Just before you answer that question, Tundra, because I know you'll, you'll go on at great length, I just want to say to everyone who's, who's joined us, thank you very much. Before, while, while, while we wrap up, if you've got any final comments, please do put them in the chat box. And if you in particular would like to sh you know, do something like this yourself, you'd like to share your project with the world, you know, do get in touch with us at the Beam Exchange um, we're always looking for new proposals for webinars like this where people come and talk about their work and we'd be very interested to hear. But meanwhile, um, yeah, do give us a, the, your final thoughts, Tondoroy, on the wider implications of using market systems development approach in fragile settings or conflict settings. Thank you, Mike. Uh, yes. Uh, one very important consideration is uh, when you walk in there, you are an outsider. And, and, and because this is a conflict, there's a lot of distrust of outsiders. And, and uh, you have to invest in dialogue mechanisms that begin to work on building the trust bringing down those barriers. But at the same time, uh, as, as I already alluded to, uh, you are walking in there with your eyes wide open. The markets are going to be thin. There's, there's just no doubt about it. And they are going to be distorted. But remember, we all want the same thing. The humanitarian, those doing direct delivery, and, and everybody else. So what, what binds us all together is markets. 
if the markets are buried because there is a humanitarian activity, then this makes it difficult to recover. So therefore it means there is never a dividing line where you are saying the humanitarians stop here, it's time for us to step in. We have to move together. We try to save at the markets, how? There are a lot of collaborations we, 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 we had with UNHCR, with ACTED, with, with, with the Norwegian Refugee Council, uh, UNDP. Uh, there are a lot of collaborative arrangements where you can then offer business models that also have solutions for the humanitarians and then say, hey, you can buy into this. One example is actually the SIYB example. The, we didn't have the service provider, we created it, but it's now an open resource in the market. Anyone can buy into it and everybody can see how we all, we all benefit as a result of, uh, of that. But when, when markets collapse, uh, the, the other issue in a conflict is, is peace building. How, how do you begin to bring people together? In business has a language that, that can bring people together. So when, when, when you facilitate the creation of platforms for negotiation by buying into innovative business models, try not to drive the process, try not to, to push in the business models yourself, allow the private sector to take part. They come up with their ideas and then you build and work on them together until you have something that you agree on. It's much easier because it means you have allowed the private sector to consider their own incentives and interests. And then you have said, let's meet, let's meet somewhere. Sometimes you have to bend over a lot. Sometimes you have to really push a hard back in. It's neither here nor there. There is no formula. You, you, you just play it by what's there at that particular, uh, at that particular time. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. That's a great way of wrapping things up. Um, so we have two, two quick things I'm going to say. One is, um, if you've enjoyed today, please, or if, or if you haven't enjoyed today, please would you comment, give us some feedback. There's a link in the chat box just been posted. Um, it takes 30 seconds to give us a quick bit of feedback on what you thought about the webinar. Um, the other thing I'm going to say is that on this theme of markets in fragile and conflict affected settings, we have another webinar in about four weeks time on July the 12th, which is going to be a, a kind of picking up on exactly the kind of things that Sandra, you were just saying, and uh, I hope you'll join us again for that because it's going to be very interesting we've we've got a kind of global perspective on on the whole challenge of, of market systems development in fragile settings so i look forward to seeing you there otherwise just a huge thanks very again um to to you all to, to you Dossi, to zakia to to you tundero for, for a really fascinating webinar i've really enjoyed it and uh, i hope we we see you all again very soon <laughs>